Once I built a railroad, I made it run, made it race against time. Once I built a railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? Let's talk about the Keynesian business cycle theory. First off, I want to give you a little background on Keynes himself, the economist. I'll set the stage a bit for understanding his contribution to business cycle theory in the uh, 1930s. Okay, before the Great Depression hit in the 1930s, Keynes had already uh, built a, a reputation for himself as a brilliant economist. And there's two books in particular that I want to draw your attention to that Keynes wrote. First off, Economic Consequences of the Peace, which came out right after World War I. This was uh, Keynes' response to the Treaty of Versailles. And if you know your World War I history at all, you'll... The Allied Powers, which was Britain, the U.S., and France, imposed very harsh treatment on the, uh, the Central Powers, mainly Germany. And the main thing was uh, huge reparations. They made Germany basically admit that they were responsible for causing the war and then they had to pay millions upon millions of dollars to Britain, France, and the U.S. as, as indemnities, reparations. Okay. Keynes uh, fought really hard to avoid this, this punishment. You know, he said losing the war was bad enough and he said if you impose harsh uh, penalties and high costs on Germany that's already bankrupt, that's already pretty much been destroyed in the war, it's going to have bad economic consequences, and uh, shortly thereafter you did see extreme inflation. Germany didn't have any money to send to Britain, France, and the U.S., so they started printing it. This caused economic turmoil, and eventually the uh, economic turmoil caused a sort of resurgence of German nationalism, and we all know how that ended up with the Nazis and Hitler in World War II. Okay, so uh, Keynes looks like a genius. He was a genius because he saw this coming. He predicted the economic consequences. In uh, 1923, now this was during the German hyperinflation, Keynes wrote a book called Tract on Monetary Reform where he talked about the dangers of deflation. He also he talks about inflation. This is going on in Europe, uh, but he also warns about deflation. Okay, you don't really you want to avoid both of them. Inflation and deflation can both be bad for an economy. Now this will be relevant because when we get to the early 1930s, we'll see what's going on in the uh, Western economies, Britain and the U.S., will be pretty severe deflation that's associated with the Great Depression. And Keynes, having sort of written about this about 10 years before, he, again, is going to look like a, a genius because he kind of predicted what eventually happened. Okay, so with that in mind, let, now let's talk about the Great Depression, and let me lay down a few facts and figures, and then we'll uh, get into the Keynesian approach to understanding it. First off, a couple of facts and figures for Britain. Um, Britain was actually kind of depressed economically throughout the 1920s, after World War I ended in 1918. Uh, Britain's economy never really recovered, but they did see a, a significant downturn in 1929, generally viewed as the starting point of the Great Depression, but only just a fairly slight decline, 5% in real GDP. But they did see a massive decline in their international trade, and this is going to be one, uh, one mechanism by which the Great Depression really becomes a worldwide phenomenon. And they also see a pretty big uh, spike in their unemployment rate. It's going to be quite a bit worse in the U.S. We're going to see something on the order of a 30% decline in real GDP over these these um, core depression years. We're going to see massive unemployment in the U.S., 25% unemployment in 1933, which is the, the worst year of the Depression. It stays above 10% for the entire decade of the 1930s, and this is what really makes it a, a depression, not just a recession that lasts for so darn long. Uh, as Keynes said there, as I mentioned in this tract on monetary reform, the dangers of deflation, well we see pretty severe deflation, 24% decline in the price level from 29 to 33 in the U.S. And one more thing of note, we see a massive decline, almost a total collapse in investment spending in the U.S. economy uh, from over the same time period. And that will be something to kind of bear in mind when we're taking a look at the Keynesian um, interpretation of these events. Okay, and Keynes in, in the context 
of these circumstances, the massive decline in GDP and the massive and prolonged unemployment of the Great Depression, Keynes basically is going to make the argument that classical economics, which is the economics of real business cycle theory, can't explain the depth and duration of the Depression because why? Well, there's no big negative real shock to, um, to put the blame for this Depression on. And in the sense he's right, there's no massive negative real shock that can explain the prolonged unemployment in particular. There will be some negative shocks we can look at, and economists will explore these things later on, but no smoking gun negative real shock, so to speak. And so Keynes is going to say we need an alternative explanation, because real business cycle just doesn't cut it here. Furthermore, he's going to say the classical assumptions, which primarily entails flexible prices, uh, and particularly flexible prices for labor, prices go down in the economy, the price of labor should go down as well to keep its relative relationship to the price of goods uh, intact. Well, that's just not going to happen. Okay, And that means if uh, prices aren't flexible, as a classical model requires, a classical uh, model and classical solutions aren't going to work either. Okay, and finally, Keynes is going to put a lot of emphasis on uncertainty and fear. Um, governing economic decision-making, particularly business decision-making, and this will tie us back into that massive decline in business investment. And go back to the solo model. Remember that investment is a big component, a big driver of economic growth. Okay. So these are going to be kind of the, the main points of departure for Keynes and then the Keynesians building on him. Okay, let's talk about Keynes' system then, and I'm going to try to simplify, and we're going to put this in the terms of contrast with real business cycle theory. It's not real shocks, as in real business cycle theory. In other words, it's not supply factors. Remember, real shocks can also be called supply shocks. Then what does it have to be? If it's not real, it is nominal. And if it's not supply factors, it is demand factors. Okay. So Keynesian theory is going to be focusing on nominal shocks to the economy, demand factors being the forces driving the decline in GDP and the increase in unemployment. Okay, now let's go ahead and put Keynesian theory into terms of our familiar aggregate supply and demand framework. I'll start off here with what we know, which is real business cycle theory. Here's our aggregate supply curve. Let's go ahead and put an aggregate demand curve in. We know in real business cycle theory, aggregate demand is not the causal factor aggregate supply is. But we'll just start from kind of where we left off. Okay, we've got an aggregate supply and an aggregate demand. Okay, now Keynes is going to say that aggregate demand, okay, and this is total nominal spending. Let's rem remind ourselves of that in the economy. And remember, aggregate supply is our real factors of production. All right, what Keynes is going to say is that aggregate demand, total nominal spending, is going to be the causal element in kicking off a recession. Okay, so I'm going to draw aggregate demand 1, which is a decline. We've shifted the aggregate demand curve down and to the left. And Keynes says this is going to cause likewise a decline in output. Let's say, let's say output here it was initially y0 and it goes down to y1. Okay, so we're going to be at this level of output. And conversely, Keynes will say the, the solution to a recession, or the cause of a boom, would be an increase in aggregate demand. Let's label this aggregate demand 2. That would be shifting the aggregate demand curve up and to the right. And Keynes says we should see an increase in real output. Let's label that Y2. So the aggregate demand curve will be operative here. Now, remember, that doesn't jive with real business cycle theory with classical economics. Classical economics says the aggregate supply curve is fixed at this level. And remember, if we, in, if we increased aggregate demand, that would in the classical world, that would just give us inflation. That would just give us a higher price level. Let's say down back here at our initial point, let's call that, let's say the price level is 100. And if we increase aggregate demand here, let's say the price level goes to 200. And if we reduce aggregate demand, the price level just goes down. Let's say it goes down to 50. Okay. Why was that? Well, because remember, total nominal spending, just the amount of dollars we spend, does not change the amount of 
land, labor, capital, or the level of technology in the economy. But Keynes says, not so fast. Okay. How do you explain the Great Depression? Keynes says, not so fast. How do you explain the Great Depression, where there were no real shocks, but output went down considerably? So we saw this kind of movement here. There were no real shocks, but output went down considerably, so we saw this kind of movement right here. And therefore the logical solution would be to increase total nominal spending to get the economy out of the slump here. What you'll notice here, what has to be true, is that there is some range over which aggregate supply will be responsive to changes in the level of aggregate demand. And what we're going to do is, I'm basically going to connect these dots. This is the implication that when aggregate demand changes, output changes as well. And what we're going to have here is an aggregate supply curve that isn't invariant to the price level and the level of nominal spending. It'll respond to the level of total nominal spending. And this will label the short-run aggregate supply curve. Now it's going to be up to the Keynesians to explain why in the short-run aggregate supply is responsive to changes in aggregate demand. But this is the key element of understanding the Keynesian business cycle theory. Okay, Why does the aggregate supply curve slope up in the short run? Okay, Upward sloping short-run aggregate supply curve. You really want to understand the logic behind this and you'll do well with understanding Keynesian business cycle theory. So what I want to do uh, for the first part of this lesson is to explain why the short-run aggregate supply curve slopes up. Again, remember if the short-run aggregate supply curve slopes up, the level of aggregate demand now matters. When we increase aggregate demand, will we get inflation? We will get some inflation. Okay, We increase aggregate demand from AD0 to AD2. Let's say a uh, price level goes from 100 to 150, but we'll also get some increase in output. Output goes from Y0 to Y2. Vice versa, if we have a decrease in aggregate demand, aggregate demand goes from AD0 to AD1, we will see some deflation. Let's say now the price level here goes to, uh, let's say, 80. But we'll also see a considerable decrease in real output, which goes from Y0 to Y1. Okay. So the short run aggregate supply curve slopes upward over some range. Okay. And this means aggregate demand, changes in aggregate demand are now relevant, are now driving forces behind business cycle fluctuations. Okay, so our task now is to explain why aggregate supply curve slopes up. In other words, why does output respond to total spending changes in the short run? Okay, It's not true in the long run, and we'll actually refer to the um, long run aggregate supply curve. That'll We'll keep that as the, the straight up and down, the vertical aggregate supply curve. We'll start referring to that as the solo curve. That's strictly based on the real factors of production. But in the short run, we want to recognize that aggregate supply or output can respond to changes in total spending. Okay, and our task now is to explain what's going on here. Okay. The answer is going to be found in this concept of sticky prices and wages. This is so, so important, so I want to spend some time explaining what this is. But really, this is just an empirical observation that was brought to attention by Keynes and by Keynesians. It's actually been known for quite some time, and it goes way back to David Hume. Uh, name you might remember from uh, Unit 1, that uh, Scottish economist back in the 1700s. Okay. But the fact is that not all prices will change to the same extent or th with the same speed when inflation happens in the economy. And this has some pretty big implications for the shape of the aggregate supply curve. To be very specific, okay, I want to list I want to uh, set up what I call a continuum of price flexibility. And what this means is how fast do the prices of various goods respond to changes in demand, or you know, to put it a little differently, to changes in the, um, the level of total spending in the economy. In other words, when inflation is happening, how fast the prices rise, or when deflation is happening, how fast the prices of, of particular goods decline. Okay. They don't all change the same. And let me just lay it down the continuum here, then we'll, we'll kind of work our way through each kind of good to talk about why. 
Okay. At the most flexible end of the continuum of price flexibility, we have commodities. And what we're talking about here is standardized goods. They're usually um, kind of bulk products. They can be minerals. They can be energy products, things like crude oil, natural gas, minerals like steel, okay, like iron ore, like copper. Uh, they can be agricultural goods, crops like corn, wheat, okay, live cattle, hogs, frozen orange juice. Okay. Commodities, standardized goods that are usually um, kind of natural resource type goods traded in very large amounts on a daily basis all across the world. These prices will react almost instantaneously to perceived changes in supply or demand. They also react very quickly to sheer changes in money or spending, okay, changes in what we call nominal variables. Okay, so commodities prices move very fast. They're at kind of the hyperactive end of the con uh, price flexibility continuum. Consumer goods, they're not going to be nearly as flexible as commodities. We'll uh, look, you can look at your commodity section on various websites or in various newspapers and or on the business news on TV if I encourage you if you ever get a chance watch Bloomberg TV watch uh, CNBC just for a few minutes and you can you'll notice they kinda have a, a ticker at the bottom they'll show stock prices stock prices by the way also very flexible but they'll also show they'll kind of update regularly some key commodities prices they'll show gold they'll show crude oil okay they'll show a few other things and you'll see that those prices are changing minute by minute throughout any given trading day Okay, so those are hyperactive. Now consumer goods, think about stuff you buy at the grocery store. These prices of course don't change minute by minute like commodities, but they are prone to change uh, relatively often. Okay. Sometimes consumer goods are commodities. We all buy gasoline for our cars and we see that price can change every day. Okay. Sometimes it'll be stable for several days or several weeks, but then other times we'll see it changes every day. Okay response to changes in the underlying supply and demand of the commodities in question or it responds more rather rather quickly to changes in the supply and demand of money itself or inflationary factors okay so consumer goods prices they can change and if we're talking about you know things on the grocery store shelf they can change maybe several times a year they're not going to be nearly as hyperactive as as commodities usually but you'll notice this will be quite a bit more flexible than as than goods on the uh, on, at the bottom of this continuum here, and we'll get into capital goods, and let's go all the way down to the least flexible, which would be labor, okay, or the price charged by workers for their labor services. The price charged by workers for their labor services, also known as wages, okay, are the least flexible, or what we call the stickiest of all prices, meaning they change the slowest in response to either supply and demand changes for that good, or in response to changes in the general value of money, inflation, deflation type changes in the economy. Okay. And let's address some of the reasons as to why this is with respect to labor in particular. Um, one big element that I want to one big element that I'll draw your attention to is that with labor, we almost universally have long-term contracts governing labor prices. Okay? And they typically tend to be maybe one-year contracts. So when you take a job, your pay will be set, okay? whether it's an hourly pay or whether it's yearly pay. It'll typically be set for a one-year interval. Sometimes it'll be less than this. Sometimes maybe you'll get an update every six months. Sometimes it'll be more than this. Sometimes it'll be every two years, three years. But on average, it's going to be probably something around one year. Okay. So even if there is massive inflation in the economy, your, your paycheck will probably eventually go up along with inflation. But it's not going to go up but at one-year intervals, whereas commodities like crude oil, crude oil and gold and steel, those things will be going up day by day by day as the inflation happens. Okay, Consumer goods might be going up every couple months. Some, some of them will go up every day like gasoline, 
other things like corn flakes, let's say, well, that has, that'll go up to a certain extent with the price of corn and the price of oil and the price of all these other inputs. But the grocery store, we talked about this in unit one, the grocery store doesn't want to irritate the customer, so they'll try to keep those price resets to a minimum. But still, the price of corn flakes could go up maybe, you know, two, three, four times in a year. Okay, capital goods are kind of somewhere in between. Maybe this, uh, they'll look, I'll suggest that they'll look more like uh, labor due to the long-term contracting effects. Okay, uh, capital goods can often be rented, and think of things like um, vehicles, equipment, trucks. You know, they can be rented for one-year uh, intervals. So the prices can reset, but they're not going to reset instantaneously. To explain why price stickiness generates an upward sloping aggregate supply curve. I think it'll help just to really to literally visualize the effect of inflation or deflation type changes on these different kinds of prices of different goods and then see what the implications are for, for business decision making. Okay, so what I have here is I have two cards, one labeled output prices one labeled input costs. Okay, and what we want to kind of visualize is that for a normal profit-making business, here's the output price of the goods you're making. Okay, you're making consumer goods. Here's the price you're selling it for, and here's the sum of the input costs per unit for the inputs that you need to buy to make those products. Okay, and what are we talking about? Input factors of production: land, labor, and capital. Okay. Input costs, land, labor, capital, with the emphasis on labor, tend to be the things with the sticky prices. And output prices, we're talking things like consumer goods, tend to be the things with the more flexible prices. Okay, so we've got more flexible prices on the output side, more sticky prices on the input side. Now let's watch what happens when some inflation hits this economy. We know that inflation is going to eventually drive all the prices up. Okay but it's not going to affect them all at the same rate. Okay, All the prices are going to go up with inflation, but the output prices, you'll notice, are going to go up more. Okay, I'll, I'll do that again. Okay, We've got output prices, input costs. Inflation is going to drive them all up, but it's going to drive the output price, the consumer goods price, up faster than the input costs. Okay. What happened to the gap between output prices and input costs? They both went up, but output prices went up more the gap between them, what is that called? Okay. Accountants, business students, entrepreneurs, what's the gap between the, what you sell your output for and the cost of your inputs? That's right, boys and girls, that's profit. Okay, And what we see here is that with an inflation, output prices, consumer goods prices go up a lot, input costs only go up a little. Okay. And that means the profit margin, the gap between these two, goes up. Now, how do businesses respond to higher profit margins if this is happening across many goods, across maybe the entire economy? How, do, how are businesses going to react to higher profits? That's right, they're going to produce more output. Okay, so what we're going to see is an increase in overall output because of what? Because of inflation, because of just strictly a higher level of nominal spending in the economy. Well, look at that. We just derived the upward sloping aggregate supply curve, right? This is a differential behavior of prices. Leads to an increase in profit margins, leads to an increase in outputs. We didn't change any real factors at all. We only changed a nominal factor, total nominal spending, inflation in this case. Let's uh, put the process in reverse and see what happens. I'll start to both the prices relatively high here. Let's see what happens in a deflation, okay? In a deflation, Prices are going to tend to fall in the economy, but output prices are going to fall faster than input costs. In fact, in the initial stages of a deflation, input costs might not move at all, but output prices are going to collapse. And what happens here, okay, output prices again, let me show you one more time, output prices collapse, input costs might go down just a little, but what can happen here is that now output prices below your input costs, and what used to be profit here now becomes loss here, and what happens to loss-making businesses, go back all the way back to unit one, okay? Loss-making businesses lose access to resources, they have to liquidate, they have to cut back on their production, they have to let go of workers, okay? And when lots of businesses are doing this across the entire economy, what's that causing? Unemployment, 
okay a decline in output recession okay you see where we're going with this you can see the logic okay when nominal spending and inflation goes down output goes down okay that's this process when nominal spending and inflation goes up output goes up profit margins go up output goes up that's that process okay so we just derived the upward sloping shortened aggregate supply curve okay and now we know that the level of aggregate demand or the level of total nominal spending in the economy is relevant okay so let's come back to our aggregate supply aggregate demand framework now and we should have a pretty good understanding as to why aggregate supply slopes up let's go back and and draw this okay we've got aggregate let's draw in an initial aggregate demand right here and I'm going to draw an aggregate the traditional classical aggregate supply curve I'm going to call this now the long run aggregate supply short run aggregate supply something like this now we said the short run aggregate supply curve slopes up within certain limits okay the short run aggregate supply curve doesn't doesn't just keep sloping up at the same slope indefinitely like this if that were the case well it'd be pretty easy to achieve prosperity in the economy we just do what it takes to boost aggregate demand to just keep on boosting aggregate demand because the higher and higher we lifted aggregate demand like this the more and more output we would get we'd go from y0 up to y1 and shoot let's do it again aggregate demand 2 y2 and aggregate demand 3 and we'll talk about if you might be wondering how do we raise aggregate demand well remember it's total nominal spending and we'll talk quite a bit about this later on when we talk about Keynesian policy um, what's total nominal spending made out of it's made out of money Okay. Can we increase the supply of money in the economy? You bet, especially now in a paper money, fiat money uh, regime with uh, monetary policy. We could increase that all we wanted. Okay, so we can. We have the technology to just continue to keep boosting aggregate demand. Um, will that c continually forever just keep on boosting our real output? Well, no, of course not. At some point, we're going to run up against what we might call our real constraints, our long-run supply constraints. Here. Remember, long run supply is made out of our real resources, land, labor, and capital. Okay. At some point, we are going to be using land, labor, and capital to their full extent. Now, you'll notice we, we will draw the short and aggregate supply curve as going a little bit above and beyond the long run aggregate supply. In the short run, can we temporarily boost our output in our economy? above this level here y0 above what's viewed as our long run potential well yes in the short run temporarily and I want I can't emphasize that enough this is a short run phenomenon we can even with a fixed amount of land labor and capital we can squeeze a little bit more output out of those given supplies land labor and capital in the short run and the analogy I want to use for right now is to just think about can you in the short run squeeze a little bit more output out of your own stock of labor and capital okay think about literally your labor your own self okay can you do things in the short run to boost your output that wouldn't be sustainable that wouldn't be practicable in the long run have you ever pulled an all-nighter studying for a test yeah so you can stay up you can dr drive your body for maybe um, 16 20 hours straight you can maybe even do that for a couple days okay in a row i don't recommend it i've i've been there though myself you know uh, college and graduate school been there done that okay but you can't go you can't go many days in a row like that you can't go a week like that and you know lord knows you can't go a year like that okay so temporarily in the short run you can boost your own output likewise the overall economy can boost its output for some time Okay, to some extent for some time and I literally I'll call this the working overtime effect okay it's not indefinite it doesn't just go on and on and on it's a short-run phenomenon and eventually you might come crashing back down and 
we'll, um, we'll kind of get into some themes of crashing back down when we look at the Austrian theory. But just realize, yes, in the short run, we can't temporarily boost up the output a little bit above, you know, we'll, we'll, we will reach some constraint here. Okay. The main thing that the Keynesians are going to look at is when we're in depression, when we're way down here below our potential output, well, they'll say we have, and let's call this Y, yeah, let's call this Y zero, zero, maybe. Down here, they'll say, well, we've got all these, uh, all this land, labor, and capital that's uh, that's idle, that's not working, and we've got plenty of room to expand because we've got a lot of unemployed workers. Okay, we'll call that slack. That's called slack or underutilized resources in the economy. Okay, and the thing is, we we'll always have to see some inflation to get this effect. Okay, so we're going to presume we're at a low level of aggregate demand down here. We'll call it aggregate demand double zero. If we get back to aggregate demand zero. Will that involve some inflation? Well, yes. Okay, remember the logic of why the short run aggregate supply curve slopes up? It's because different prices of different goods respond differently to an inflation. Okay, so we'll go from a price level zero, zero, and a price level zero. Okay, and you'll also see a pretty prevalent theme in Keynesian uh, policy this idea of the, t of the short run trade off between inflation and output gains. You can gain some output here at the expense of a higher inflation rate, at least in the short run. Okay? You can't do it indefinitely. Eventually you get into what we call the classical portion of the long run aggregate supply curve, which is just a vertical aggregate supply curve, and then adding more uh, total nominal spending to the economy gives you what? Well, it gives you strictly inflation. Okay, We'd have this aggregate demand curve here, this aggregate demand curve here would be intersecting right here, and this aggregate demand curve here would be intersecting up here somewhere, and then we'd only we'd see strictly inflation effects from adding aggregate demand, which that will tie that back in the quantity theory of money uh, as well. Okay, total nominal spending, which is made of total nominal money supply. Okay, if we just kept adding money to the economy, well, sure, eventually well, that's just going to cause us inflation and potentially high, painful inflation and potentially painful inflation could actually reduce our capital because it reduces things like lending and, uh, and impairs business decision making so we actually could get an effect where we're moving backwards okay and we'll we'll come back and we'll talk about that as well okay this thing's getting a, to be a bloody mess so I mean, let's uh, let's reset and start over okay we have our basic theory in place so we know that here's aggregate demand long run aggregate supply classical aggregate supply concept based on real factors of production and then short run aggregate supply which will look something like this this is the Keynesian concept of aggregate supply and we know that it slopes up in the short run okay and therefore what therefore the level of aggregate demand matters and if aggregate demand slumps off like this, if aggregate demand decreases, what are we going to see in the economy? We're going to see a reduction in output from Y0 to Y1. And we're likely to see a reduction in the price level. Let's call it price level 0 down to price level 1. Okay. Now I hope this is starting to sound familiar to us because uh, if we think back to what we saw in the Great Depression, what did we see? We saw a pretty big deflation in the economy, in other words, a pretty big drop in the price level, and a pretty big drop in output, and sp specifically a big drop in output that wasn't just a GDP decline, but it was a big unemployment problem. Okay, So you, hopefully you can start to see why the Keynesian framework is going to fit the facts of the Great Depression really well, and therefore it's going to be very appealing to lots of people. and and. Um, Keynes is going to get a lot of recognition for you know, creating a new paradigm that explains the kind of depression we saw in the 1930s. Okay, to sum up though for now, I want to take us back to this focus on aggregate demand, total nominal spending, and the main point, okay, to, to really simplify things, the main point of the Keynesian story is that aggregate demand matters. Aggregate demand is the most important thing, the causal element in the business cycle. Changes in aggregate demand, total nominal spending are what's driving short run changes in total economic 
output and employment. Okay, and with that in mind, what we're going to get into ne next is a more detailed, a more nuanced, and a more powerful an analysis of aggregate demand changes using what we call a dynamic aggregate supply and demand model. It'll be familiar to what we've already done with aggregate supply and demand, but we're going to sort of kick it up a notch and we're going to make it um, very applicable to real numbers that we can draw from real economic history. So we'll, um, we'll do that next. If And I recommend here, because it will get a little complicated, don't move ahead until you're really comfortable with what we've covered right here. If you need to go back and watch this again, if you need to go back to the book, please take your time, because it does get a little complicated. But if you understand it, it'll become a very powerful tool for you. Once I built a tower up to the sun, brick and rivet and lime. Once I built a tower, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime?